My name is Simon Marnie, and I am teaching fellow at the UCL Centre for Digital Humanities. I'm also a programme director for the MA and MSc programme. So I use social media both in my teaching and in the area of information studies, I'm teaching the students about social media and how to use social media safely. One of the big issues that I, I talk about is the things not to do. I don't tell them what to do, that's up to them, but I often tell them what not to do and what they shouldn't do. Anyhow, uh, I'm also on the steering committee for the SMKE, and at UCL we didn't award a scholarship um, in our area, which was social media and the museum, but that didn't stop us doing a workshop. So we went ahead and did a workshop and with support from Claire Ross, my colleague and friend Claire Ross here, and also from Mark uh, from the Grant Museum, who spoke to you all yesterday, uh, we put together this program. Um, it's sitting there on our um, UCLDH blog at the moment. I have sent all the details, and I, I hope it'll all be up there on the SMKE blog uh, also. But I've actually put the presentations up there um, for you. Um, the other reason, secondary reason for, for putting my name up on there, is to enable you to find it, right, if you just Google me, and then you'll come up with a centre, and then you come up with a centre blog. And if you scroll down um, a couple of weeks, um, it's on there. Um, but we had a really great day, very successful workshop. Uh, we had 25 uh, participants and a variety of speakers. Um, and they ranged from social media uh, museum professionals, uh, PhD researchers, early career researchers, and also a small bunch of MA students as well, who are using um, social media or investigating some aspect of social media um, in their dissertations, which is what they're working on now, I hope. So we had um, Mark Carnell from the Grant Museum, who we heard yesterday, um, tweeting moles. The Jar of Moles is one of their most famous exhibits, and the Jar of Moles has its own Twitter account. I was under the misconception that when I was reading tweets from the Jar of Moles, it was Mark and the Grant Museum tweeting. Apparently I was corrected, and it's not. It is somebody else, right, using the, the Twitter avatar of the Jar of Moles and the Jar of Moles from the Grant Museum. I'm sorry, I'm getting blank faces. Is anybody familiar with the Grant Museum at UCL? The Jar of Moles. When you go in there, it's right in front of you. Yeah, it's a little jar like that. If you're fond of little furry creatures, they'll walk quickly past. Don't look at it, right? It's a jar of pickled moles. Okay. Um, well, I have to put this in context. The Grant Museum is a museum of zoology. How do they describe it? It's zoology, yeah? So it's got exhibits, weird and wonderful exhibits. They're partners of ours because Claire Ross is, is actually doing a research, has been involved in research projects um, with them for curating and some other ones. So we had Mark Carnell uh, tweeting moles. I also had my, had my friend Alex Smith, who hasn't made it here today, which is a real shame but she's from the Islington Museum, and she's just started a new job working for History Pin. So again, she was talking about the use of social media, but the Islington Museum is a very, very small municipal museum. It's actually underneath the town hall in Islington, if anybody knows that part of London at all. We also had um, a couple of speakers from the um, Museum of London, uh, Laura Lannan and Ellie Miles, talking about collecting social media as a museum object. That's one of their research projects where they are gathering together um, social media and collecting that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an object of museum study. We um, also had Dan Pat from the British Museum on product consumption, uh, and he was talking about a lot of different ways that you can appropriate um, material and data mine from within social media by using things like APIs and very, very low-tech issues. He has two presentations. One is the high-tech. This is all the stuff you can do with um, social media material that's out there if you have the necessary skills. But for our, for our audience, he gave us a simplified version. This is what you can easily do to with a little bit of code that I'll send you and extract some data from that. Um, and it was rounded off with a social media challenge, exactly the same as we had yesterday, but a smaller version. So that was a dummy run, and that's the reason we incorporated it today, because it sparked some very, very interesting uh, and useful reflection, as well as study on the whole issue 
um, of how do you deal with those very, very awkward posts, tweets and responses that come your way. Uh, I didn't write this up um, as a blog. I just simply put it on there because Claire beat me to it, uh, being a very uh, ardent blogger. Uh, there's a link there actually to Claire's blog on there so you can read all about the presentations um, on there and I'm just giving Claire a plug here for her blog as well. Okay, uh, Add it to your, your feed and your reader list but you can read all about it up there uh, and that went online probably the following day whereas it took me several days to collect the presentations from the various speakers. So that was a fun day um, and it ended up with a drink session in the Grant Museum as all our events do. So if you get invitations <coughs> to any events at UCL and DH, I will guarantee you that there will be a drinks event at the end of it. And I will guarantee you that we always over-order on the food and we over-order on the alcohol. If somebody else, if somebody else is paying... Oh, I shouldn't have said that, should I? You need to delete that bit off of there. If somebody else is paying, we always over-order on everything. It's OK. Um, did I miss anything out? No, I think I covered everything. Do you have a mailing list? Uh, we have a mailing list. Yes, please do. Uh, if you go to our centre pages, um, there, is, um, there is a mailing list on here, uh, which is, Matt, which is um, run by Sarah. Uh, but we also have our uh, centre blog, and there's also the departmental blog, which publicises all our various activities on there. OK, well, the topic of this session now... This was a filler, by the way, because we are missing one of our speakers. And again, apologies from Julian Harrison, who couldn't make it today. So that was my infill. I'm like the warm-up act. I always feel like the warm-up act before the main act comes on. Uh, the topic of our uh, panel now is strategies for developing your social media practice. And we have two speakers, uh, my colleague Claire Ross from uh, UCLDH, uh, and also Jim Barrett from uh, Humlab at uh, Umea. Is that? Umeo. Umeo. Okay, I can't do that. Sorry, I'm a, three, I'm a Londoner. Three letters in this. At Umea. Okay, Umea. And one of the themes yesterday was the, the different accents. So we're going to have uh, two more accents for you. And of course, being a native Londoner, I, I don't have an accent, yeah? Okay. <laughs> so you can take me out of the equation, but we have a couple more to introduce you to. Who's first? Jim, let me come. Enough from me. Um, my accent is um, Australian, uh, 12 years in Sweden, um, and before that, four years just wandering around the globe. Um, but I settled in Sweden in 2000, and I've been working at the University of Umeå University, which is in the northeast. In particularly, I'm based, we have dual affiliation, I'm based in the language studies department but I'm working in a digital humanities lab studio environment, which I think many of you have actually had contact with Humlab, and I'll show you some of the products, some of our results, deliverables that we've come up with in this presentation. Also, it's, I've really enjoyed the past 24 hours. It's been great listening to the conversations and discussions and speakers, and, and I'm trying to respond in some way to what people have been saying. So I posted this this morning, and it's already had 49 hits, which is encouraging, and an embed also, which is nice. But um, I put in the comments, because then I'm using the browser, so I, um, I put in some explanation, and then I have the comment. I have to refresh the page. Yes. Because I was going to use my laptop. Okay. There's my comment. And um, I couldn't do the link, so I was just thinking about um, I was, my presentation is actually has a title too. It's uh, Social Media is Academic Economy. And I was trying to think of some ways of trying to frame this very disparaging, huge area that we're talking about here and all the different threads that, that weave together. And maybe economy is a good sort of metaphor in some ways, based on the idea that it's, uh, it's a system with values and rewards based on exchange. But in response to what other people have been saying already, um, I just wanted to show you some examples that came to my mind. Um, I was thinking a lot of, in the previous session, um, which I was really thought-provoking, and does, has anyone heard of this distant reading? It's being con, um, developed out of the University of Stanford, where Umeå University is um, uh, 
collaborating with the University of Stanford. Franklin Moretti there has been working on this, looking at um, large data sets around literature and, and doing concordance and, and calculations of verbs and things like that. But, but in opposition, not really in opposition, but perhaps complementary to the idea of close reading, which is incredibly established in my field, looking at distant reading. And then this prompted thoughts about the logics of software and the fact that we're in a situation here where we're, we're dealing with a different structure, a different reality in many ways. And perhaps this sort of research that people are talking about, the actual conditions that we're experiencing when undertaking the research should dictate the parameters of the research. And I'll get more into this as I develop my talk, but, but logics of the media need to be acknowledged. And perhaps, I'm not sure about this, I haven't really developed it so far, but, but I think distant reading is perhaps an example of attention to the logics of something like software, or that you're dealing with large data sets. And then this idea of being anonymous or, or diluting out a, a sample population to such an extent where you cannot identify individuals. And then recent events with espionage, surveillance, this sort of stuff. Are these actually signs of the world to come? Now, I tweeted before the famous William Gibson quote about the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. <laughs> I suggest following William Gibson on Twitter also. He's a, he's a master. Um, and then something that I think shocked me, if you haven't already seen it, um, this is a professor at uh, NYU, I think it was, who probably wishes he'd never heard of Twitter. <laughs> um, this gentleman here tweeted this, uh, this tweet. <laughs> it took off. He deleted it um, not shortly afterwards tried. Uh, then there was an appeal on his blog, which was basically him on his knees pleading. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing today. This only happened a few weeks ago. <laughs> but um, he's, uh, he will be forever associated with this. Forever. And this is an example, I think, of... This is... It's not publishing, it's performance. We're performing ourselves through this medium. <coughs> And when you extend yourself in this way, if you, if you don't think about it, it will have huge repercussions. And you have to be careful about how you do it too. Context, I made a mistake recently. It wasn't really a mistake, it was perhaps um, uh, not thought out. I went to the Vatican last week on Sunday, which is perhaps not the best day to visit the Vatican. <laughs> There were a lot of people there. <laughs> we couldn't get in. We couldn't get into the Sistine Chapel. I left, came home, read The Guardian, and there was an article in The Guardian about a, a, a pedophile ring that has been suggested. The Pope knows about all this. And I, I made a flippant tweet about it based on the context of being in the, the Vatican and, and the tens of thousands of people in the heat. Seconds afterwards, I thought, no, <laughs> this could be serious. I don't know the full context of this story. I don't know the implications of it. I got rid of it quickly. I'm not particularly well known. <laughs> so it doesn't really make any difference. I don't think people will pick it up. In, and it wasn't a particularly bad anything. It was just not well thought out in the context. This, on the other hand, has cost this man enormously, I think. And it's not publishing. I think he's performed in a way that perhaps reflects badly on, him, on his profession. There's further, um, getting back to this idea of logics, um, I'm trying, I'll start the presentation now. So, okay. A um, little bit of information. Why social media? Um, I did it in tweet size bites. Uh, I think I've, in my research and in my practice with social media, I think a lot about um, space and the fact that cre we're creating a space for research and learning. Space is, has the potential to be ephemeral. I'm very interested in the idea of audio, sound, and how sound creates space. Um, if you play your music very loud in your apartment, your neighbour will complain because you are extending your space into an area that you are not paying rent for <laughs> and somebody else is paying rent. <laughs> In the same way, I think a lot of digital media extends space. 
creates spaces for people to share. And this can be mediated by language or more complicated media, such as virtual worlds, which is another area that I work in. Um, another reason to be interested in social media, I think, is producing, archiving, and ordering your work. When I'm trying to, at the end of the year, formulate reports for my university about what I've done, um, I don't really use my diary. I use my blog, my Twitter, uh, appointments, calendars, these sorts of things. And I can formulate a fairly consistent and fairly accurate um, report of my activities because I maintain this ongoing presence and I pay attention to it. It's in it, it also archives and things like that automatically. Um, I'm performing as an ap academic beyond the walls of the academy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm extending myself out into a public arena. Um, somebody mentioned before about the notion of publics. This is very interesting. I know uh, Dana Boyd, the famous um, social media researcher, has, her dissertation was on publics, uh, where she used Habermas's ideas of publics and tried to develop them for more appropriate um, purposes in relation to digital publics. Um, it's not really my area in many ways. I deal with texts, so I don't have to deal with people, which solves a lot of problems. <laughs> but I do have to deal with meanings and implications, I think. Um, sharing your work beyond your discipline, uh, trying to extend and repurpose or, or see the relevancy of your work outside perhaps the most obvious like demands of being an academic, publishing, um, pr problem solving, these sorts of things. Uh, issues, uh, explaining to, uh, in a, in a, in a contextualised way. These are things that we do every day, but then there are applications, infinite applications, I think. Um, I was approached through my online presence, I was paid, approached, this is a bit of a brag here, <laughs> I was approached by BBC Four to be on a program about the dial poem poets, the New York poets who recorded these poems and you could pick up your telephone and ring up and hear a poem. And this is technology, network technology, language mediated by technology. But that came to me through my online presence. That's how they found me in Sweden. Yeah. Um, so um, you're witnessing your work develop. Nothing like a blog, I think, for watching yourself progress. My blog is uh, 10 years old, and I, I've been tempted to get rid of the first two years of it. <laughs> <laughs> but the atrophied preface. Uh, <laughs> but I, um, I keep it there because it's interesting. And nobody reads it anyway. So. <laughs> but I was a very yeah, enthusiastic person with very poor grammar. <laughs> um, Taking something with you from your desk, the idea, this is again this uh, national um, applications within national um, frames. In Sweden, we have a particular set of um, uh, regulations regarding our work as academics. We own everything. Um, there's very strict rules about students filming in classrooms at my institution. Students are not allowed to film uh, teachers without prior permission. And even then, it has to be negotiated through the university these sorts of things, but at the same time, um, everything that I produce in my position at the university is mine. I take it with me when I leave. And that can be negotiated with the university too. But another way of, of moving, I mean, if you're working on Moodle or something like this, ping pong, blackboard, these teaching platforms, if you want that to follow you or to be, you have access to it, the course is over, but you've got, you need the notes or materials and stuff like that, I think a blog is a great way of doing that. It's also a way of getting material directly to students or colleagues or seminar participants directly after. And I'm going to show you an example of that at the end of this. Uh, you're marking your work as your own. In relation to copyright, it is complicated. Um, something I think a lot about also in the context of Sweden. Um, the Pirate Party movement in Sweden, free copyright, open source, creative commons, incredibly vital active um, dimensions to Swedish public life. Uh, and I'll show you a film documentary that you can all download for free, legally, <laughs> about that too. So, um, but when you are publishing, my understanding is that by publishing on a public website or a blog, I'm identified as the author of that work. If anyone correct me if I'm wrong, I understand that is the case. So therefore, I, I do have, even, I've even been told that mailing something to somebody else, an email, once it's time-stamped, there is an, you know, the implicit suggestion that you are the author of that. There is some way of 
Um, anyone who's seen the film um, The Social Network and The, the Brothers, what are their names? <laughs> There's the... Yeah, yeah. They, their mistake was that they got one software developer. <laughs> they should have had two <laughs> and given them different parts of the program. <laughs> they gave it to one person. And he changed it and he didn't infringe copyright. Um, and also something somebody suggested to me yesterday, although we were talking about posing questions to the collective. I think it might have been Matt who's, who's left. So he was talking about idea, putting ideas out. You know? Where can I find this? Where is this source? I'm, I've got a text, but I, I have an earlier edition or a later edition than I need. Can anyone point me in the direction of this or this or this? And it works. It's a very, I mean, the wisdom of crowds and this sort of idea of collective problem solving, I think, works through social media. But, and this is what you could call the Wikipedia dilemma also, we have a policy where um, we're not allowed, and this is debated, uh, Wikipedia is not to be used as a reference source. Um, mainly because of the technology, because of the updating. But I mean, each page is hist historically recorded anyway, so I mean, but then you get some very odd references too, and you get opinions, and you get and something, another theme that I think that has run through this, this conference has been this sort of amateur professional divide, which I think needs a lot of work and discussion, and um, I'm not sure, I don't think I can come to any conclusions about it, because I, I think it's very important for us to be part of the community also, and I don't know how strong this divide is going to be in the future. Okay, and then I was thinking also about the rules are not yet written, um, these are principles, and this is also in response to the discussions we've been having over the last 24 hours. I don't believe we are here to be popular. Um, I, and I, uh, ethics, then the next is the ethics, morality, rationality um, is not in agreement. I'm trying to come to terms with Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative and this idea of ethics and morality. And I'm trying to work it into some sort of, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just trying to pay attention to it. And I'm trying to see what I'm trying to do is look at the logics. This is actually work that I'm doing in my PhD thesis, looking at the logics that are suggested by the media. And this is an area where there is so much contradiction between copyright law and prefaces, particularly I'm looking at prefaces for digital texts what and end user license agreements. What they're actually telling you that you're allowed to do and what you can do is contradictory. And, and I find that illogical. So the material might allow you to do one thing, the laws, another, tell you to do another thing. And how do you reconcile that into an ethics? Um, the example that I thought of and I gave in the comments section was Sony, the company Sony, has every time you buy a CDR, a burnable CD, a licensing charge goes to Sony, who is the inventor of the compact disc. Yeah. But then you can go and burn movies <laughs> on that disc. But then if you try and transfer that film to a Sony product that has digital rights management software installed on it, you can't do it because they've got this protection software. I was one of the people who bought a mini disc. It was a nightmare because <laughs> of the DRM thing. I now have an MP3 recorder, which is so much simpler and does such high quality recordings. And the logic of that machine appeals to the uses which I wish to apply it to. So I'm following through in a sequence of logical steps, I think, that are implied by that object. This is related to what Catherine Hales has written about as materiality, reading materiality, reading these structures that exist in architectures, which is something that is relatively new, I think, for sort of Western hermeneutic discourse, reading the architectures of a book and, and how that arranges logic, syntax and things like that. This can be applied to digital media also. This is something that I need to work on more. The academic work is central, not the media. So the debate we had yesterday about somebody criticizing, like somebody's speaking presentation. <laughs> I, I have some colleagues who saw Jacques Derrida speak at the University of California, and they traveled specifically from Sweden to California to see Derrida. And they went away extremely disappointed. He didn't explain lang language, history, culture, or anything. <laughs> He just said libraries are good, basically. That was, his, that was the point of his conversation. But he, he, he doesn't have to appeal. He doesn't have to, and there's a tremendous pressure in social media to appeal, to have, and then you have in the UK impact, which is a very difficult term, I think, to work with. But whether impact is numbers, is density, 
is is that structure it's I don't know um, but the, the work is central even in the humanities I think there are methods that are that are closely scientific it may not be repeatable but we're working with empirical data information objects um, as I pointed out with that unfortunate tweet before, you will be or you are identified with your media. It's a performance. And you are performing yourself through that. And as, as Jenna sort of raised in her presentation through our work together too, the, the idea of embodiment, self, identity, relating through this media also, and was touching on this, I think, with this ethics idea too, this the self is being portrayed or performed through this media and the consequences can be severe or, or very good, very good also. Um, and then I go back to McLuhan also. I was actually looking for a quote from McLuhan where he spoke about we're trapped by this idea that we, we, we have old terms to describe present situations. We're, we're re returning to publishing, we're returning to this sort of older understanding, sort of a remediation, that we have to go back to something that we already share as a cultural or cognitive concept, we have to use these in order to communicate. But the same intention here is, I think, exists here. Media has substituted themselves for the older world. So we're trying to look, I'm trying to look for, for indications of, of best practice or ways of understanding that may not be centered in Western culture. I'm Australian and I'm looking very interested in Aboriginal narrative structure and how Aboriginal stories are preserved and how, how they're performed and how they're shared. They're very embodied, they're very place specific. Um, these sorts of, that's just one example, but you could look at very many things and try and find some new angle for understanding this human system that we're developing using technology. And then trying and applying and tweaking terms and things like that rather than automatically following on from... And you see this in, in books, you know, um, Elizabeth Eisenstein's, this, her, her work on pu book publication, early book publication, um, the Gutenberg Galaxy, these sorts of ideas. Um, tools are producing new experiences of space, and um, that's sort of a summary in a way. And then language is not reality, but it helps create it. Whether we're, we're to break into that cycle, this sort of... I've noticed with virtual worlds, there's... I work in Second Life, these sort of virtual spaces. There's been cognitive research done where people who are, um, like, people have physical reactions to the world, yeah? Um, or psychological reactions to the world. They found that short and tall people, if you give a tall person an avatar, they're more likely to accept an uneven split in a negotiation deal, whereas a short person who may be more likely to accept an uneven split in a real life situation is more likely not to accept it when they have a tall avatar if, this, if that negotiation is undertaken in a virtual space. They've also found that people lose weight when they have thinner avatars than when they do when they have... Reality is, is uh, not a very... It's a consensual thing. <laughs> Um, and then finally, the third um, thing I was talking about is um, research. Um, a lot of the research that's been discussed today, and I think this is very valuable, but I'm just thinking that the research is a lot about finding out what people do. I have an idea that you might follow on with this, about paying attention to, to young people and what, what are they doing? How do people use this? How do we harness these behaviours in order to make it somehow fit with what we already have, this fantastic tradition and this huge body of knowledge? I wonder if we, if we shouldn't expand research in some ways to look at other possibilities or rather make it sort of more prescriptive. I'm not sure, but this is just an idea that I have. So then I broke this idea with social media, gathering of research can be from or with, and we've spoken about that. You can either use the social media as the object of study or you can be using it as the tool, the vehicle, the, the conduit to be doing the study. Uh, and then. Jenna raised this, what is the language of social media? This is, this is the big question. What is, what is it that we're negotiating here? How are people expressing themselves? Um, I've seen, I tweeted a, a site, um, I can't, you, me, you, you, me, me, you, I can't remember the name of it. It's basically um, a website, younow.com, where people can log on to a screen and they have a live feed of a video, right? There are other people watching who can chat. 
the number of people watching you and how long they watch you brings your rating up of the thousands of people that are broadcasting themselves. And you just broadcast yourself. You're just sitting there. You know? And people are asking you questions. <laughs> and, and you can respond to the questions in the chat. You can talk. You can play music. You can... It's, it, yeah, it's sort of live reality TV, but just watching each other. Surveillance in the home. Is it, is it surveillance? Is it a broadcast channel? Is it television? Is it... And, and what is the language of How are we going to relate to people who are online constantly? Cameras that are watching us constantly. Google, Google Glass. I will be filming you while you're watching me. And then I can be broadcasting you watching me somewhere else. And you can be broadcasting me at the same time. <laughs> One idea I had that is a potential way out of this, I think, is and something that I'd, we've been talking about very legitimate sources. And there has been this sort of talk about illegality, legality, but I think we do have to pay attention to the people who are breaking the law. Not actively and not particip participating in it, but as an object of study, as a research area, and coming from Sweden, the Pirate Bay is a, is a big area. Oh, it's not going to open. Okay, we'll do it this way. It's called AFK, which is away from keyboard. It's a reference to the trial. Um, when the judge was hearing the, the first trial of the Pirate Bay, um, he kept saying, in real life. And the Pirate Bay people said, no, we don't use in real life, we say away from keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the, the film. It only came out in February. And it's about the, the appeal trial, when things were looking bad, and they were basically... Uh, but you can watch that. It's in Eng it's English subtitles, I think. And this culture that these people represent is a is a world for millions of people. Yeah. I suggest watching the whole thing. But this is the culture that, that is developing around us and people are living in. And it's not totally legal. Um, and, and this is why I'm very interested in hacking and this idea of hacking. Uh, I, now there are hacking spaces. I think 8,000 hacker spaces have, um, have opened in the United States, which seems to be, as a, as a sort of institutional concept, it's somewhere between a technical college, a university, a community college, and run by the people who have the space. And then finally, just your work will live on in the echoes of your media. The, 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 the new descending a skit staircase to Champ, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>